Proclaiming the Gospel of Grace. Learning to live everyday life and multiply grace and peace. And he knew it was God that gave him this victory. And it was after God had blessed, I told you, I'm going to bless you. Anybody who curses you, I'm going to curse them. So he knew this. He knew that when he went in there to take this territory and get back his nephew, that God was the one that had empowered him to do this. How in the world can these servants go in and take these kings, Eric, take all their stuff? There's no way God empowered him to do it. Are you with me? So when he comes back from the slaughter, Melchizedek, and his name means king, king of Salem or king of peace. Who's that sound like? Right, right. Yeah, that's right. Jesus. And it says, uh, then Melchizedek, king of peace. And his name, by the way, means king of righteousness. <laughs> so he's the king of peace and righteousness. He's a picture of Jesus. Right? And, uh, all right. So then Melchizedek, king of Salem, king of peace, brought out bread and wine. So here's the first mention of, of Melchizedek. And he's a type of the, of the new uh, high, high priesthood of Jesus. He comes out with what? Communion. He comes out with communion. This is the first mention of Melchizedek. He comes out. Here's Abraham coming back from the slaughter. He's probably tired. He's exhausted. So Melchizedek, picture of Jesus, brings out communion. What does that represent? Healing and forgiveness and restoration. That's what Jesus does. Why do we receive communion every single week? What is this, a Catholic church? Because we want to remind you that Jesus came to do every single time you come to church. This is not about me or you. It's about him and what he's done. That's what the new covenant is. So we remind ourselves, as often as we do this, we remind ourselves of his death. What he did in his death has saved me from death. What he did in giving up his life has saved me in this life. Are you with me? Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. And he, uh, he was the priest of God most high, Elyon. Elyon is what most high means right there. And look what Melchizedek, who's a picture of Jesus, did. And he blessed him and said, under the old covenant priesthood of the Levitical order, they could bless or curse you depending on what you did. Under the new order of, of priesthood, under the new covenant, there is no cursing. It's only blessing. There's only two verses here mentioned about Melchizedek. And watch what they said. Back up to that other one so you can see. He brought out bread and wine. Then Melchizedek brought out bread and wine. He was the priest. Look at the next verse. Here we go. And he blessed him and said. What is Jesus doing? He's blessing you, speaking stuff over you. What does he say? Blessed be Abraham, Abram of God, El, of El Elyon. Possess, El Elyon means possessor of heaven and earth. Abraham, you're blessed by the God who owns everything. This is, what God, this is what the new covenant priesthood is. We're blessed by the God who owns everything. Say, I am blessed by the God who owns everything. All right? Blessed be the God most, be God most high. Who has, who has delivered your enemies into your hand? Is he going to deliver your enemies into your hand? He has delivered your enemies into your hand. When did he do it? He did it at the cross, but he's showing us here a picture of what the high priesthood has done. He ha who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and watch what Abram's response was. His response was, this is before the law. No law at this time. He presented the Lord a tithe of all. This lets us know that tithe is relevant today. But it's Eucharist. It's, it's a response to the blessing that God has, has done to us. We respond by going, Lord, I am blessed by God most high. Here is my tenth of everything that you've blessed me with. It's a response. Are you with me? And blessed be God most high who's delivered. Is that, is that the, oh yeah. And blessed be God most high who's delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. Did y'all see that? That's all the verses there mentioned about Melchizedek. We're under the high priest order of Melchizedek. He only blesses. God is not cursing you. He's only blessing you. And even when you go through a dark time and there is discipline and God will discipline you, but you've got to know, he's only going to bless me through this. He is not going to discipline you with sickness, with disease. Are you with me? He's not going to do that. God is going to love you with his word and he will get your attention though. 
Come on, somebody. Hit the person next to you. Say, God, I know how to get your attention. <laughs> now, turn over, to, turn over to Genesis chapter uh, 15. Chapter 15. Real quickly, real quickly. Let's look at the Abrahamic covenant. Man, this is taking me longer than I thought. Look at the Abrahamic covenant. Now, God had, God had told Abraham, I'm going to bless you, Abraham. I'm going to bless you. Everybody who blesses you, they're going to be blessed. Anybody who curses you, they're going to be cursed. And he saw that in chapter 14, right? God made him very, very wealthy. But God told him, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. But he didn't have a son. He was, he was impotent in his body. He and Sarah couldn't produce any children. So he comes to God and says, hey, God, you promised me a child. And the only, only person that I have as a, as a descendant in my household is, is Eliezer, who's my servant. He said, that's not going to be your, that's not going to be your heir. And, and God took him out of his tent. If you read this whole chapter, it's only a few verses there before, but he, he was, Abram was in his tent and God said, stick it out of that tent. Come out here. He said, look up at the stars of the sky. He said, if you can number the stars of the sky, that's how your seed is going to be innumerable. God spoke that in his heart and he, and he was in his tent. Now get, y'all get what the Bible's telling us here. When this is my message, but he was in his tent and God said, you're thinking too small because you're inside of that little, all you're looking up is what you see around you. Step out of there. Let you look at my world. He was inside of his tent and God said, no, no, you can't see who I am in there. Step out there and look up at the sky. Broaden your perspective. I did all that. You think it's a problem for me to give you a child? You think it's a problem for me to change your finances? Do you think it's a problem for me to heal your body? It is no problem. Step out of that tent and look up. I'm the one that hung those stars up there that hang. I'm the one that causes the sun, that causes the planets to go around the, 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 the sun. I'm the one that did that. And look what happened. And he believed in the Lord. Are y'all with me? That's what you need to do sometimes because our world gets small. We start looking at our little circumstances and say, oh my God, God is letting me down. God ain't letting you down. God will get you to the point just like he did Abraham. Abraham, he believed God when he, remember, he looked up at the stars and said he believed God. Right? But then look at, and, it, and he, God counted it to him for righteousness. Very important passage of the new covenant right there. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the, uh, Ur of the Chaldeans. I'm the one that brought you out when you was a moon worshiper. Come on, man. I'm the one that brought you up out of there. How in the world do you think you got here with all this stuff now? I'm a, come on. You need to look back at your life. You remember when you was on drugs? Do you remember when you was messed up on whatever it was you was messed up? Push the person next to you and say, you are not excluded from this. Don't you forget what God delivered you from. Push that person next to you and say, I know it's snowing outside, but don't you forget what God delivered you from. Well, Pastor, I wasn't that bad. Now, those are the hardest people to save right there. <laughs> well, you know, I wasn't as bad as so-and-so. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a hard time receiving from God with that. We was all sinners and lost, all of us. Every one of us without him would be a mess. Look at this. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the earth, Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. Watch what he says. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Have you ever been there? That is so awesome right there that he said. How will I know? You promised me this, but 10 years has passed by and I still don't see it. Come on, y'all there? Anybody there? Come on, yeah, this is for you then. So he said, look at here, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. How many animals? Five. Five always represents grace. Five-fold ministry. Five smooth stones David had. Oh, and so on and so on throughout the scripture. Then he brought all these to him, to, right? God told him to go get these animals. Abram went and brought them to him. He cut them in two. Did y'all see them animals? Those are some big animals. A couple small ones, but most of them was big. Cut them right down the center. It's got, back up so y'all remember them animals. Three-year-old cow. Come on, three-year-old cow, that's big. All right, three-year-old female goat. Heifer's a female cow, but a female goat, that's a big, come on, y'all seen a goat? He's going to cut these things. And a three-year-old ram. Ram. You know what I'm talking about? You've seen them on Wild Kingdom and all that? And a turtle dove and a pigeon. Okay, the animals, the birds are small. But those other ones are big. Look, hit the next verse so y'all can see. And he cut these. He gave them to them. And he cut them in two. Splitting a cow down the middle. 
That's, y'all get the nasty mess it is? And placed each piece opposite the other. Here's half the calf here. Here's the other half here. Here's half the ram, half the other half of the ram, half of the goat, half of the rope. And he just tore it. Well, y'all all right? He tore the head off the birds. <laughs> it's all in Leviticus. Watch what happens. What is this representing? God's going to make a covenant with him. Jack, can I borrow you for a second? Yeah, thank you. Give him up there for a second, Dana. Come on. Dana, holding on to your hand. I saw Dana sitting there like this. Let go of Jack a little bit. Hey, hey, Jack wouldn't mind. I'm just playing with y'all. Y'all know this thing. So watch. So a covenant. God is about to make a covenant with them, right? So, so their animals are covenant. Oh. Hey, let's come down here. <laughs> it was like, whoa. <laughs> let's come down. So, so here's what's supposed to happen in the covenant. Animals cut in half. What is there? What's down in the middle here? A blood, guts, mess, all kinds of stuff down here. Here's what's supposed to happen in the covenant. So two people making a covenant. God's going to make a covenant with man. And typically what will happen, they'll, they'll cut or make a, a cut in the wrist or in the arm or in the fingers and, and exchange some vows right here. Everything that's mine is yours. Everything that's yours is mine. And now you go and we make some vows and you stand where I stood and I'll stand where you stand. And what a covenant, what it depicts is now I stand where you stood and, I, and you stand where I stand. And now everything that's yours belongs to me and everything that's mine belongs to you and we're one together in covenant. Are you with me? If he's strong in war and I'm strong in uh, a business or something, now we need each other and we become this partnership. And what the pieces in half represents is if you or I break this covenant, this is how we're going to end up. Come on, say marriage is a covenant. Y'all don't want me to mess with that. We just had marriage. Come. Make some noise for, for uh, Jack. Come on, come on. All right? Now, What's supposed to happen in the covenant is that. But here's what happens under the Abrahamic covenant, which is a picture of God's new covenant for us. Watch this. So he cut the animals, but then the vultures came down on the carcasses, and Abram starts getting involved to try and protect and drive them away. All right? The son's going to, it seems like nothing's happening. He's got all this. God's in, he says, God, how am I going to believe that this is going to happen for me? God says, go get some animals. I'll show you how. And so he splits the animals Abram knows he's about to cut a covenant with me. He's about to cut a covenant. But now these vultures are coming down to start eating up the the animals that are down here. So Abram starts trying to shoo them away. When the sun was going down, what does God do? A deep sleep falls on Abram. Boom, he knocks. God, (laughs) too too illustrative, aren't I? God knocks him out. Why? Why? God's saying, I don't need man to protect or intervene in my covenant. You go to sleep. You rest. Watch what happens. Then he said to Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in the land that is not theirs. He starts telling him why he's sleep, what's going to happen. Jump all the way down. Jump down to, uh, oh, just go to the next one. Then he said to Abram, no, that's, get the next one. They'll be in slavery 400 years. And also the nation whom they were to serve, I'll judge afterwards, tell them what it's going to do to Egypt. Next. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried at a good old age. That happened. But in the fourth generation, right, they shall, uh, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not complete yet complete. That's another story. And it came to pass. Here we go. Here's where I want to get to verse 17. And, and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven. Huh, like a cloud. You get it? Like a, like a cloud of smoke. Yeah, have you ever burned something in the oven and up, big old cloud comes out? And a burning torch that passed between the pieces. Now, do you remember how God led the children of Israel? How he led them? He led them by a cloud in the day and a fire by night. Who, what is the, the cloud? The cloud by day is the Father. The burning torch or the fire, the light at night is Jesus. So what does God do? He knocks Abraham out, lets him sleep. But then God makes a covenant with Jesus. The Father makes the covenant with Jesus who stands in as the representative for man. God makes a covenant with himself. Jesus as the one. Are you with me? Came to pass that he passed through between those pieces. So now, here's what's happened. Here's what's happened. God is not going to rely on man to be, uh, to be the... He's going to make him the sleeping beneficiary of the covenant. He rests while God works the covenant. 
This is how the new covenant works. Jesus, why did Jesus go to the cross? Because man broke the covenant. Jesus is the one that pays now. Not man. So this is why Jesus went to the cross and was ripped and torn and broken. Are y'all with me? Why? So that man gets all the benefit of the covenant while he rests. Come on, say, we're supposed to rest. What that represents is simply believe. Let God do the work. Are y'all with me? Now, let's hurry up. Let's go to the terms of the new covenant. Did y'all see it? I've explained it all right there. Now, let's see what these three effects of the new covenant. Go to, back to Hebrews chapter 8, and let's see where we are. Verse 10, yeah. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Here's the first effect. First effect. Say first effect. First effect. Okay, there's going to be three. First one is... I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. All right? So the first, I knew y'all would do this. I knew it. This is why I had to explain all this other stuff. Because all three of these effects are simply having relationship with God. What this first one means is God says, I'm going to write my laws. No longer am I going to lead you with two, two pieces of stone with commandments on it, he says, I'm going to write my laws in their mind, uh, uh, put my laws in their mind, and write them on their hearts. God's saying, I'm going to lead you from the inside now. God is going to lead us from the inside. Now watch, watch what this means. In a nutshell, what it means is this, that God is not going, he's going to deal with us each on an individual basis. Now think about this. The fact that he can lead us from the inside says he loves us so much and the price has been paid for God to live on the inside of us. It's internal GPS. Most of what the Holy Spirit will say to you, things that God, he will mostly direct you in what not to do. When you'll hear the Holy Spirit the loudest is when you're about to do something wrong and he'll, he'll cause your peace to be unrest. Most of the time when we're looking for a word, word from God, you can, God speak to me, I don't hear you speaking, why don't you speak to me? He most likely is not. Mostly, he's going to lead you from the inside, where he'll let you know on the inside if this is right or wrong. Mostly, he'll tell you not, not to do that when you're about to do something that you shouldn't do. Are, do y'all hear what I'm saying? You're about to make a decision on a purchase, and in and, and your heart, you go, ah, I just don't feel good about this. I'm just not right about this. All right? Typically, that's how he'll, he'll, he'll guide you. Are you with me? It'll be mostly a no like that. Uh, and I can show you that through the scripture, but we'll, we'll, we'll do that on a Wednesday night. Okay? So he'll lead us from the inside. Now watch. The law says you should not commit adultery, but it doesn't say love your wife. The law doesn't say that. Now, here's, one of the, here's, here's how important it is for God to be on the inside of you. And this is one of the things I'm leery of just doing marriage conferences where they tell you a bunch of stuff to do. Go get your wife flowers. Do this. And you're supposed to kiss them this many times a day. And you're supposed to do this many times a day. My wife don't like flowers. So every time I just buy her flowers, this is a waste of money to her. I need to hear from the inside. God will tell you some morning. Some mornings God will speak to me before I leave, the, leave out of the room because she's laying down typically when I sleep. And he said, go over there and kiss her right on her lips and tell her you love her in her ear. On the inside, I'll feel that. Like, uh, I'll just have a desire. I, I want to go and whisper in her, in her ear while she's laying right there. Or sometime I'll just be in the store. I'll, well, let me get her something, something. It'll be a guidance on the inside. That speaks more than me buying her flowers if I said something stupid. Notice how that flowed out if I said something stupid. There's a good possibility I might have said something stupid. There's a good possibility. But you follow what I'm saying? And I need that internal guidance with my kids too. I need this. I need this internal. See, I don't know what everything that's going on, but the Holy Spirit, I got to talk to him. What God is saying is if you'll work with me, I'll lead you and guide you into all truth. I'll show you what you need to do. Not a book of rules telling you what to do. I want to live on the inside of you and give you unctions and lead you and guide you. It's a much better deal. All right, that's the first effect, okay? Second effect, let's go to the next one. All right, uh, yeah. But this is coming, I'll put my laws and write them in the minds and heart. Here's the second effect. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. I'll be their God and they'll be my people. You say, well, big deal, what does that mean? What God is saying right there, whatever it is that you need, I'll be that to you. This statement is all throughout the Old Testament. And, it, and every time it happened, he was, when they needed hunger, when they needed food, he rained down manna from heaven. When they needed a miracle of going through the Red Sea, he brought, he, he, whatever it is that they needed, God is saying, whatever it is you need, come to me. I'm that for you. Now, now watch. We want to say, God, 
I want you to just say you're going to bless me with money. God's saying, whatever it is you need, I'm going to be that to you. Now, what most of us think is we got to figure out something and do something. God is saying, no, come to me. I'll be that to you. The whole new covenant just keeps pointing us to him. I'm going to lead you from the inside. I'm going to be your God. I'm going to do it. I will. I will. I will. The whole new covenant is about you being able to be close to God. Under the old covenant, we always had to think, am I doing this right? Did I do this right? Did I do that right? And if you have these kind of thoughts in your mind, know it's the devil trying to put you under the law. All you and I get to do, have to do is go to Jesus and say, Look, Lord, I'm looking to you. I'm looking to you. If you don't show me, I ain't going to know. If it's something I need to change, you got to tell me because I don't know otherwise. And I'm not just going to do something because somebody else said do something. And what it does is take the pressure off of you and put the pressure on him. Stop running to other people to try to tell you what to do. Run to him. Run to him, Lord. Say, Lord, I'm looking to you. If you don't tell me what to do in this, I'm not going to know. So you have to show me. You open the door. You do it for me, Lord. That pleases God. That's what the new, I'll write it on your heart. I'll do it. I'll be your God. I'll be the one that brings you the miracle when you need it. Come on, somebody. Here's the third, third effect, third effect. Verse 11, none of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, know the Lord. That word know right there is gnosko. Know the Lord for all shall know me. Edo. Now that word right there is edo. They'll know me intuitively. They'll know me without effort. For the, uh, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Notice, all three things have to do with closeness and God leading and you, him know, you knowing him. All three. This tells me the whole New Testament, the whole New Covenant, is about us having relationship with him. He said this New Covenant is built on better promises than the old. The old was, do this and I'm going to bless you. The New Covenant is, come to me, I'm going to take care of all of it for you. See, I knew y'all wouldn't get excited about that because, this whole th because we don't understand the gravity of how cool the situation is that we have with God. God says, whatever your problem is, just come to me. Nobody's going to have to tell you how to do anything. I'll do it for you. Come on, somebody. Push the person next to you. Say, I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this. <laughs> all right. Now, all these three things, these three effects, Effects of the new covenant happen because of this next verse. Look at this next last verse right here. For I will, for, the word for means because. I'll be able to be in your heart, write my laws on your heart and on your mind, put them on your mind. Why? Because I'll be merciful to your unrighteousness and their lawless, and their sins and lawless deeds. I'll remember no more. I'll be able to, what was the second, the second, uh, the second effect was I'll work miracles among you. I'll be your God, you'll be my, why? Because I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness. You say, Pastor, I don't, God doesn't seem to be leading me. Here's why. Do you know that, all your, that, he, that your sins are completely forgiven? The whole new covenant is based on you knowing that you're in right standing with God. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. But Pastor, I don't seem to know God. I don't, seem to, I don't seem to know his leading. He doesn't seem to be leading me in these things. Here's, this is the cause for all, this is the cause for all the other effects. All right, cause and effect. Do y'all get this? If I lay out in the sun, I'm gonna get sunburned. The sunburn is the effect. The cause was me going out into the sun. In order for God to write his laws on my heart and in my mind, I have to know that my sins are forgiven and I'm righteous with God. In order for him to do all those three effects and to God, this is your answer to everything. And it's better than the old covenant. Are y'all listening to me today? I knew when I come in here today, I said, now, Lord, you're going to have to help me let them see it because I want them to see that this whole thing is based on you being with God. Many of us, for the problems that we're facing, are looking outside. If somebody else, you, you think your boss is your problem, you think your job is your problem, you think that your spouse is your problem, you think your, your business is your problem, it is not, none of that is your problem. And if it is, God says, I'll fix it for you if you just come to me about it. Don't you try to fix that and try to resolve it. Just come to me. I'll write it on your heart. I'll lead you. I'll guide you. You'll know me. Knowing me is the whole deal to it all. All right, all right, all right. Now, uh, uh, go to the last verse. Then I'm going to show you all one more and we're going home. I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness because 
All these effects work because I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Next. That's a, turn over to this passage right here in, in Philippians. Write this down. I'm going to give this to you, but I want to show this to the next servant. Why this is so important, watch this. Turn to Philippians. This is Paul talking. Look at verse, uh, chapter 3 and verse 8 and 9. 8 and 9. Mm. Eight, and nine, 8, 9, and 10. <laughs> and then we're closing. 8, 9, and 10. Amen. Philippians. What I want you to see here is that you knowing that you're the righteousness of God causes all the other effects of the new covenant to happen. Paul here. Paul explaining his, his life here. Watch what he says. Yet I indeed count all these. He was just talking about all the accomplishments that he had as a Pharisee and a scribe. He says, yet all these things I count lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, next, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, which, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from, uh, from God by faith, that I may know him. Mm. All the stuff that I've done, everything that I could do, he says, I count it for nothing. That means nothing. Why? What's most important is that I know that my righteousness came from him so that I can know him. When my, when I, there's something about you knowing that you're right with God that gives you this closeness with God, and now he can speak to you. Now he can write his law. Now he can direct you when you know we are right with God. When you get in a position where, oh, oh God, God's mad at me about this. God says, now I can't talk to you. If you know you're in right standing with me, now I can direct you from the inside. Having the righteousness of God that I may know him in the power of his right. I'm able to now know him because I know I'm the righteousness of God. Close your Bible. I've, I've, I've done all I can do right there. Y'all receive that? Now, this is meat, y'all. This is really meat. This is why I love y'all. Now, y'all didn't have to have an organ or any of that stuff stirring you up. What the Bible tells us here is if we know Christ, that we're the righteousness of God, that now he can lead us and guide us in every affair. Every, he can be the miracle that we need. Everything happens because we know that we're the righteousness of God. Did y'all get that today? Amen. Praise the Lord. Close your Bible. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Friend, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I want you to know, first of all, God's not mad at you, but he's madly in love with you. And he's got a great plan for your life. And it begins with making Jesus your Lord. And it's so simple. Say this simple prayer with me. Say this, Father, in the name of Jesus, I believe that you are Lord. Come into my heart and be my Savior. I believe the scriptures say if you said that simple prayer, you're born again, forever forgiven. God's forever for you, never against you. And the rest of your life will be the best of your life. God bless you. Proclaiming the gospel of grace. Learning to live everyday life multiply grace.